Welcome to The Economy Magazine. I'm Benjamin Chong Alfares with the top stories in the global economy. Coming up today, solar power takes off on Wall Street and Syrian business initiatives offer basic relief. First, look at the headlines. European shares rallied and Russia's stock market climbed 2.5% after Russian troops were ordered to return to their bases. As tension in Crimea subsided, both London's FTSE 100 and Eurostoxx 50 gained just over 1%. Markets also took heart from a $1 billion pledge in U.S. aid brought by Secretary of State John Kerry during his visit to Kiev. Rising tensions in Ukraine had shaken global corporate giants as the standoff threatened sanctions and clashes clouded sales forecasts for companies exposed to Russia's vast market. The world's 300 wealthiest people lost a combined $44.4 billion as global stocks tumbled and the ruble dropped to an all-time low. Japan's salaries increased for the first time in almost two years in January as companies boosted pay for part-timers. Base pay, excluding bonuses and overtime, rose 0.1 percent from a year earlier, the first gain in 22 months. Consumer spending and industrial output are surging ahead of a sales tax increase in April, fueling demand for part-time workers. But overall pay fell 0.2 percent, the first drop in three months. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's next challenge will be to generate sustained wage gains to help households cope with higher taxes and rising inflation. In the UK, manufacturing activity rose for an 11th month in a row, though flat bank lending and high energy costs continue to hold the sector back. The manufacturing PMI hit 56.9 in February, slightly up on the previous month, and showed rising employment in the manufacturing sector. The government wants to double UK exports to $1.7 trillion by 2020 and raise manufacturing's share of output to 15 percent over the next five to ten years. But the sector's output remains about 9 percent below its pre-crisis peak, while overall GDP is 1.4 percent below. And U.S. tech tycoon Bill Gates once again tops the Forbes World's Billionaires list as Microsoft shares surge. Bill Gates' total fortune hits $76 billion, beating out Mexico's Carlos Slim's $72 billion. The annual list included 1,645 men and women billionaires with an average wealth of $4.5 billion and a collective wealth of $6.4 trillion dollars, up one trillion from a year ago. Gates, who owns 4.4 percent of Microsoft, making up less than 20 percent of his fortune, has been the world's richest man for 15 of the past 20 years. With the solar power craze on Wall Street propelling startups across the U.S., 2014 is set to be a big year for solar power. In New York alone, an extra billion dollars is being invested by the government over the next decade. More on this report. At first glance, there doesn't seem to be anything out of the ordinary about Victory Food Services Warehouse, but there's more than meets the eye to this facility in the Bronx. So here's the solar system. 340 kilowatts. Up on the roof, over 1,100 solar panels produce enough power for 39 homes. Part of a recent solar boom, installations like these are turning up throughout New York's boroughs. The city's largest solar plant installation sits on a rooftop nearby. Installed last December, the 4,500 panels at Jetro Cash and Carry provide 40% of its energy. Behind all this is a policy from Governor Andrew Cuomo, known as the NY Sun Initiative. It's made a huge change for being able to get projects up, large commercial projects in New York. Since its launch in 2012, the initiative has provided over $100 million for public and private solar projects across the state. At the offices of OnForce Solar, CEO Charles Fate looks over plans with new hires. The project's going to be on this building right here. And here's another view. Charles got into the solar business almost by accident in 2008 when he was looking at options to power his own home. Basically started the company, with, it was me and my Blackberry. Um, and we, since then, we've been probably doubling and tripling staff every year. In 2014, Charles expects staff and revenue to double again. With New Yorkers paying the highest electricity bills in the country, 
a growing number of people and businesses are looking for alternatives. I think you have a perfect storm of items coming together that became on the forefront of everybody's consciousness. One is the environment, two is energy independence, and three is job creation. Governor Cuomo is now hoping to extend the NY Sun initiative to 2023 with an additional $1 billion of funding. He says that will create over 13,000 jobs and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2.3 million tonnes a year. This and similar initiatives across the country have seen stocks in solar companies grow by a third between 2012 and 2013. Easily half your bill goes into just delivering the energy to the facility. Why do that when you can put solar on the roof? It's an idea that's catching on as New York's solar power soars. Joining us now is freelance reporter Batya Sushrabi for a look at women and economy in feminomics. So Batya, thanks for joining us. I understand you have been looking at a recent study of Haredi or ultra-orthodox Jewish women in Israeli society. There's a special employment trend here? Yes, the Haredi women are now entering the workforce as a result of uh, Netanyahu's government um, uh, child allowance budget slashes as of 2004. The women are living on the husband's kolel stipends, which amount to about $500. Kolel, kolel being seminaries, right? Seminaries, Jewish, right, exactly. Right, they're, yeah, seminaries. And they're living on $500, and with eight kids, that does not make ends meet. Okay. So a lot of these women are going out to these, what are called uh, high-tech outsourcing centers in their communities. Has, and there's been a lot, has there been a lot of uh, uh, support from the government as well in this sense? Yes. So as of um, the finance ministry invested $88 million in an effort to get these Haredis to go into the workforce. Right. So these women are working in these local outsourcing centers, um, and it's, it is sensitive to their religious needs. Okay. Um, Why does this matter? Because, first of all, it's um, changing the mindset of staying at home to going out to the workforce. Right. So these outsourcing centers are sensitive to their religious needs. They're in their communities. The schedules are set around the kindergarten's um, timetable. So the, kid, the women can go in at 8, they can leave by 2.30, and their first priority is a mom. And in terms of outsourcing, is this different uh, from outsourcing, say, to India or to other places in the world? Yeah, so these outsourcing centers are now choosing to uh, open in Israel as opposed to China or India, because they're calling these Haredi women outsourcing's new secret weapon. Oh, okay. Why is that? In what sense? How can you can you illustrate well, that? Well, these women are very highly ethical uh, workers, and um, based on their religious background, or, or what is that based on? I mean, is or is it that they're more focused essentially, or well, they they don't take a lot of personal phone calls. They don't chit chat. They're there to work, and their first priority is to be a mother. Mm -hmm. um, and they do their job and they go home. I see. Okay. And what can you tell me about in terms of uh, what the actual numbers tell us? Well, the numbers say that as of 2011, 61% of Haredi women are working. Okay. And the Haredi make about 11% about of the population of Israel. And um, the High Tech Forum in 2013 said that 7,500 women are working in high tech. Okay, well, actually, we can see uh, images of uh, Israeli women in Israeli society at this point. Um, what does this mean for their husbands? Their husbands, generally speaking, are w working less, right? Well, they don't work at all. I mean, they're working, in, they're sitting in these kolels, which are um, these religious s seminaries. seminaries that yeah. They're devoted to studying Torah, and they're earning about $500, which, like I said, that doesn't make ends meet. But what does this mean for the household, then? It means that the women are now the new breadwinners. Okay, and, and so... Ultimately, what's that is, does it have some sort of a sociological uh, impact? Well, um, what, with them being the new breadwinners, let's see if there's a new change in the dynamics of the family. I see. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Bajah Sharabi, Bajah Sharabi, for your input on Israeli women in the uh, workforce. Thank you very much. Thank you. We move on now to Damascus. While the civil war in Syria continues to rip through the country, traders have found innovative ways to establish a much-needed new market. Daniel Roth has a story. In the heart of Damascus sits a ballroom converted into a bazaar full of clothing, makeup, food and electronics. The idea was born by three traders whose businesses declined after the beginning of the armed conflict in Syria. The idea of the bazaar came from the current condition in the country. Many companies closed, many associations were stopped. So they started to find activities. 
That is why we started to contact these people to see if they are willing to be with us in order to organize a trade market where people can find the idea of selling and buying in the right way. The advantage for traders here is that they can set up their stands for free. The lack of overhead charges are reflected in the low prices of the goods sold. This small but significant difference can be important compensation to residents who must deal with the ever-increasing inflation, which is not controlled by the authorities in the midst of war. There are many offers that attract customers. This way, we all help each other. After all, the goal of this thing is we help and you help us. The prices here are even half price lower than outside. This suits the budget of all people. Anyone can come here and buy. It is suitable for all budgets. For some residents of Damascus in the heart of the conflict, this marketplace is a breath of fresh air. By the end of 2012, inflation was estimated at around 120 percent, and some experts believe it surpassed 200 percent in 2013. And we're joined now by Daniel Roth for a look at the international media in Media Watch. So, Dan, I understand we have something from Swerve. Yeah, so Swerve, which is an in-app marketing platform, which yeah. basically means they deal with ads in mobile games yeah. predominantly. They did a study, and they found out that 0.15% of mobile game users are doing 50% of the shopping from games. 0.15%. Uh, are doing 50% of the shopping. So when you're targeting ads in games, you're talking about getting 0.15% of the people. That leave, leaves more than 99% of the people out of the picture. Yeah. Out of the picture, and you're you know you're targeting a very small and selective group. Most of them also within a day of buying a, of using a game, they'll make a purchase, and within two weeks of that, they'll make a second purchase. So the people who are really doing the buying are addicted to games. Um, and uh, and sort of and they're addicted to 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 shopping mm -hmm. <laughs> essentially, um, and everyone else, almost everyone else, isn't doing any of that. Interesting. Um, Have you identified what kind of people they are? I mean. Is that well, a legit I mean, there's lots and lots of studies about who are gamers, and uh, you know, you've, uh, you people tend to think of teenage boys mostly, right. but, but it's, it's not true. Uh, I think nearly half of gamers uh, in the U.S. are women. Uh, the average age is 30. Um, so it's so we're you talking know, about junkies, really. We're talking about people who are just sitting out. You know, as soon as they come home, yeah, people well, like you, but to perhaps. But be, to be specific, we're talking about junkies of all kinds, uh, <laughs> people of all different backgrounds who are addicted to Angry Bird mm. and GTA and ah, uh, various indeed. games. Jeez. So it's you know equal opportunity junkiness. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> On that junkie note, um, so McDonald's, you know, famously has been sued for having hot coffee that. It's too hot. They were once sued by a gospel singer uh, be, for ruining her voice because actually they deserved it. There was glass in the burger. Oh They're gosh. being sued now $1.5 million because wow. they didn't give a guy enough napkins. Mind you, there was some racial tension in there. Apparently, it was a black customer and a Mexican-American manager who may have gotten into it, and that may may be part of the case. That uh, um, so, but the lawsuit is for one and a half million dollars. Oh my gosh. Um, and I got to remember this one next time I go to McDonald's, which I yes, don't, by the yes. way. But you know, <laughs> if I were to, then I would use that. Yeah, well, it's uh, you know pretty serious. There's some really weird lawsuits out there, and this one you know may get more into some social issues. Sprint is being sued now by the federal U.S. government for 21 million dollars for overcharging the U.S. government for wiretapping. Uh, so, <laughs> in the midst of all of this Edward Snowden NSA leaks, we're hearing that people are watching us in the bathroom, in the bedroom, everywhere. You're being watched, and meanwhile, Sprint is making a couple of million bucks off the government. Hey, so, they, so yeah, you might as well, right? Yeah, if they're going to do it anyways, you might as well make some money off. It. Right. So, right. The, you know, the government's uh, suing them. $21 million <laughs> they're trying to get uh, because Sprint is, is making some money off this whole, you know, whatever scheme is happening and, that we're being watched under. <laughs> Good stuff. They obviously know what they're doing. Yeah. So it's uh, really interesting. I, you know, 
particularly I remember as a kid uh, thinking when I would went to McDonald's, uh, how am I going to sue these people? Because that was right around the time that hot coffee, uh, the hot coffee one came out. Uh -huh. And uh, it, I remembered sitting there thinking maybe if I pull out a hair, then I put it in the burger, I can trick someone. <laughs> uh, and I remember once one of my friends actually got a free burger this way. It was very funny. But... Uh, there's, you know, <laughs> there's many... Something tells me it would not work in Israel. You know, that, that's all I have to it's say. say it, what? It there's there's a work. hair in your burger. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you very much for those insights into how to make money of the big companies. Thank you very much, Daniel Roth. That takes us to the end of this edition. Thanks for watching. Do send us your comments, your feedback, and join us again tomorrow for more.